Good evening. Welcome, welcome to our special episode of the AI for Good Fireside Chat. So today that we have a very good program, uh, and we're going to start the program uh, having a conversations uh, with my colleague uh, from the Harvard Business School here, uh, and uh, then uh, we are going to uh, have our uh, data science capstone students sharing their experiences uh, that working uh, with our sponsor, uh, NASA, on their capstone project. So um, my name is Bruce Wong, and I am the director of the master degree program in IT uh, at Harvard Extension School. And I also teach data science, and I taught the first course in the curriculum, and as well as the capstone. Right. So uh, today you will be seeing and uh, listening and hearing uh, from uh, our capstone students uh, who are actually graduating at the end of this month. So our guest, uh, uh, honor guest here, and uh, we are very, very honored uh, to have uh, Dr. Mark Antonio Awada. And he is um, someone that with a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, uh, educated in Britain uh, and in the um, Imperial uh, College uh, in London and uh, uh, postdoc at the University of Cambridge uh, and spent a number of years uh, in the industry uh, as an entrepreneur and as a physicist uh, and as a research scientist, a professor. And currently he is the head of the research um, and, uh, um, in uh, data science uh, at the uh, Harvard Business School, the three uh, institute uh, and in, at uh, HBS. And uh, that is Dr. Mark Antonio Awada. Thank you very uh, much. Mark Antonio, well, thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and uh, so um, we have been doing this uh, fireside chat for AI for Good uh, to share experience and to share knowledge with our students and uh, others. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to talk about tonight uh, is uh, given that your role uh, at uh, the Harvard Business School, um, that you know, uh, what, uh, maybe that we can start having the conversations, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, so when you, when you, when you think about uh, business school, when you think about uh, financial modeling, right? And uh, that, um, what's that have to do with AI for good? <laughs> That's a good question. Thank you so much, Bruce. Well, I mean, let's put things from a historical perspective. Um, quantitative uh, finance came, you know, into, into the light, I would say, after a major breakthrough in 1987 by two mathematical economists, I would say, Black and Scholes, who actually have discovered how to model you know, asset behavior, in particular stocks, and how to price them. Now, why that was a major breakthrough? Because you know, this is a, an asset that has a random behavior, totally difficult to understand, yet they managed to put a theory behind it and a comprehensible theory. What was the result is a discovery of a product, which now, these days, we call them derivatives, call options, put options. And this became a one multi-trillion dollar industry. So from there on, of course, quantitative finance flourished. Why? Because now we're talking about capabilities and abilities using mathematical models, uh, well-defined mathematical models, to understand asset behavior, and not only understand asset behavior, in fact, be able to kind of do prediction, provided we have data on them. So that's the connection between the data, the theory, and the predictability. Now, the AI piece is quite generic. So before even we talk about what's the context of AI here, let's in fact quickly say what is now quantitative finance, why it's very successful, why, you know, it's effectively boils down to creating models on asset prices and be able to ingest data on those prices and predict, you know, predictability is a big component. So get data more, train, learn. So it's the issue of learning, the learning process the learning process from the data and from the learning process of the data, now you're able to predict. And that cycle of data learning prediction gives ultimately the, the symptom of intelligence. Add now machines and hardware, that's AI for you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so, and again, um, given your role at the Harvard Business School and uh, the head of research, um, 
uh, of the Data Science Initiative and the D3 Institute there. Um, so you, you, you must be looking at uh, quantitative uh, financial methodologies all the time, right? Um, that's what business school does. And so what, what is the implication of quantitative methodologies um, you know, in the finance uh, industry? Again, thank you for this question. I mean, quantitative finance, of course, has reshaped the way we think about finance. Why? Because before, you know, prior to these discoveries that I mentioned in 1987, the normal way to invest is, was intuitive. In a sense, you would think about a company, you would think about who's running the company, its, you know, um, debt, its income, and you make an assessment whether it's a good stock to buy or sell. But what, when, what do you do when you have 300 companies, 2,000 companies? It's humanly impossible. So now you have to have a systematic process to understand the company. So now how do you understand the company? You can understand the company through its data, its prices, its characteristics, you know, how much it makes profit, how much it loses, what's its debt ratio. All this data is actually speaking, is shaping, giving a picture about the ecosystem of that specific company. So imagine now the scalability of that. You can do now, Chris, the, you know, the S&P 500. So this process of the ability to actually use data in science and be able to write specific models to do prediction and understand the behavior of these stocks' behavior, that's what ultimately led to this breakthrough in finance. Because now I can make prediction, I can actually predict when I should buy or should sell, or maybe not to trade altogether. And that led to a huge explosion of, of hedge fund managers. I'm sure you can read a lot of them all. <laughs> Most famous is Renaissance Technology, where they use essentially state-of-the-art, you know, data science and AI to predict the market and to trade the market and to make profitability. And now, therefore, we are talking about here a multi-trillion dollar business. So quantitative finance is no more just like a small experimental shop. It's here. People know how to make money. It's a secret sauce. We have to admit that. It's not like anybody's going to tell you how they rate their models or how they do it. But ultimately, you know, there's a lot of investment and you are involved in it. You would learn the art of how doing it. So it's, it's a, it's a, that's the reason why it's successful. It's, it's the combination of science, uh, art of trading, experience in the market, and, and the technology that brings it all together. So this um, semester, right, uh, this cohort, we actually have uh, 10 different uh, capstone teams. Uh, some of the capstone teams focus on um, working on an area that has to do with uh, environmental sciences yeah. and uh, that some teams has uh, doing uh, working on in areas like uh, has to do with like uh, uh, medical and uh, yeah. that uh, uh, identifying diseases and so forth right but we also have teams that very interest in uh, uh, investment strategies yes, right yes. and uh, that so so the question for you is that why is uh, data-driven investment strategies uh, still a powerful source for generating profitability uh, for companies such as like uh, asset management and uh, hedge fund, right? Yeah. Uh, companies. Well, let me give you a small example. I mean, I think uh, a small example can 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 speak volumes. Essentially, what you know the quantitative methodologies allow you to do is to get insights inside that data using models. So you take two stocks, for example, IBM and Dell, you know, and the data says, well, today, in fact, IBM is overpriced and Dell underpriced. Both of them are computer companies. Yeah. The model is capable of doing that because the model now took the data of IBM, took the model of Dell, took the macroeconomics data also, ingested that data, analyzed that data and came to the conclusion, of course, with some rules and laws here, uh, that IBM is overpriced and Dell is uh, underpriced. So the models say you sell IBM and you buy Dell. That's what we call statistical arbitrage. And you do that with such a speed that a human person cannot reason quickly to, to kind of find that insight. That's the key. The, 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 the machine learning algorithm can find that size in, in fraction of a second and can take the order, buy and sell in fraction of a second. So you are ahead of the game of many other people who are sitting still thinking about whether should I buy IBM, should I sell Dell here and there. So imagine now you're doing this across, you know, hundreds of stocks with the speed of light and you are ahead of the game. That's how you're generating profits. Okay. All right. So uh, <laughs> well, but now, and now that uh, beyond the um, 
um, the way that we normally uh, um, use uh, AI and uh, data science, right? And uh, over the last 12 months or so, uh, the, uh, the, the world is all talking about AI, right? Mainly is basically driven by um, the launch of uh, ChatGPT, the applications that uses uh, GPT, right? And uh, that version three, version four of the GPT. And so this concept of large language model uh, become the talk of everyone. So, um, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that this uh, uh, is um, appropriate uh, for the finance industry as well, right? And uh, so, so how, did, how, how would you see that the uh, large language model or generative AI, how, how would that shape the financial industry? Thank you. That also is a great question. So let's go back now to the financial industry or quantitative finance. What do they do? They are light years ahead in the game, but they don't kind of make a big deal because they say, say the secret sauce. So at the core of the data that quantitative finance utilize is not only quantitative data, i.e. numbers, but also unstructured data, reports, uh, filing, legal uh, documents, newspaper, sentiment, what the CEO said on Twitter and what they didn't say. All this information actually is relevant in the decision making of investing in a specific asset, buying a specific asset, or trading a specific asset. So natural language processing already been in the, in the game of quantitative finance for many years, way beyond this revolution of large language models. Now, what large language models provide is a fast track now to ingest a huge amount of data, global data, summarizing that data quick on the fly and help investment managers to make decisions very quickly rather than spending sometimes you know weeks or months analyzing these, I would say, unstructured data, these reports, understanding the sentiments. Now, large language models can give you sentiment analysis. It can give you summary of reports. It can tell you, in fact, you know, um, you know, this is specific stock because of the news in China or Hong Kong or in Europe should be a good stock or not a good stock. So this is a very powerful information, but it is in the making. And I'm sure that it's going to be a one of a key components um, in, in, in the investment strategy to kind of Mention that point, I used to work at Morgan Stanley. And Morgan Stanley from my for the last few months, they've spent you know, tens of millions of dollars of incorporating now generative AI into the framework of their investment portfolio. So that kind of gives you an idea how some of the top investment banks, hedge funds, are utilizing now these new uh, tools uh, for that. But of course, one cannot get uh, too much carried away. One has to use these things with cautious. I mean, quantitative finance is a very, uh, reserved field, despite the fact it's a very uh, sophisticated field. Why? Because in the end of the day, it's, it's about making money or losing money. So you don't want to use tools that actually loses money. So while you are embracing AI, you have to use to embrace generative AI with, 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 with that in mind. Wow, wonderful. And so you mentioned Morgan Stanley Venture, uh, Morgan Stanley, and uh, that uh, so Mark Antonio and I uh, have this little thing in common that uh, when he was with Morgan Stanley uh, and helping them with uh, investment strategies and uh, that, uh, well, Morgan Stanley Venture at that time was actually my investor uh, for my startup, right? And uh, that, uh, so, um, so as the head of research and data science at the D3 Institute at Harvard Business School, what do you do? Excellent, it's a great, exciting opportunity, DCUBE. Uh, DCUBE stands for Digital Data and Design. It's launched last year through the Harvard Business School. And it's centric around labs. And these labs are run by PIs who are actually professors and junior professors and senior professors, each in their own domain. So um, some of them are in climate change, some of them are in digital transformation, some of them are in organizational behavior. So I have the great opportunity to actually be involved in different facade of research and provide that data science expertise, me and my team, we have a small but very good robust team to actually kind of work with these labs and these PIs to scope research problems and try to solve them with the data science framework. Oh, wonderful, and uh, thank you for sharing. So I have been talking to uh, Mark Antonio for some times and uh, that and finally persuaded him uh, to teach a course for us in our data science curriculum, right? So uh, maybe you can say a few words and uh, what is that you are preparing to teach for us? 
Yeah, I mean, the course is uh, it's uh, Applied Quantitative Finance and Machine Learning. So the title speaks itself. What it's, it's about how we practitioners, I still still do it, and even though now I'm at Harvard, when we were in the financial industry, how actually we designed investment strategies to actually trade the market and to make profits from them, how we design portfolios on those strategies, and how to risk manage those strategies. Making money is not just only about making it, it's about also keeping it and not losing it. So believe me, 50% of the work is on designing the strategy, but 50% is on risk management and managing portfolios. So I'm hoping with that course, it will give a very good you know, description and cover of those various topics in the course. Thank you very much, Thank and uh, that is an honor to have you, uh, you. you uh, offering the course uh, to our students. Uh, speaking of uh, our students, uh, that uh, so like I said, um, we have been um, offering the master degree, right, mm. the ALM degree, uh, and uh, that uh, the field of study in data science. Uh, as part of that um, degree program, um, the last thing that they do before they graduate. Right, and uh, is that they come to mm. uh, Harvard uh, and uh, spend um, uh, three weeks residency here mm. uh, at Harvard, and uh, to to work with uh, their peers uh, in a team-based uh, capstone project proposal, and then the following semester, and uh, they go back and uh, to um, their location. And, uh, but they will continue to work with their team uh, to finish that capstone project, right? And yes. that capstone project is not a class project. Mm. Uh, we keep telling our students, right? It's a capstone experience. It's, it is one of those unique, exclusive experience that are only uh, available here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so what we wanted to do uh, in, uh, with this event uh, is to bring our students out and uh, to uh, have them share uh, with our audience today um, about uh, their experience uh, here uh, at Harvard on campus, uh, as well as working with their sponsors, right? Mm. And uh, so over the last three years, uh, we have worked with a number of sponsors and uh, from like Microsoft and uh, to NASA and uh, to um, United Nations NGOs and to um, airport uh, technology companies and to you know, a, a number of, uh, 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 in including uh, a, a private equity companies yeah. and uh, uh, news, uh, global news companies and so forth, right? Now this team uh, who are here today to share their experience uh, that uh, they um, are very uh, fortunate uh, that uh, earned the sponsorship uh, from uh, NASA. Mm. And uh, so over the, the last um, few months, right, started from the summer, and they have been collaborating uh, with a NASA uh, scientist uh, to complete their project. And they are now get to the final end uh, of their uh, master degree journey. Oh. So maybe we welcome uh, our students, uh, bring them out here and uh, to share their experience. That'd be great. So the uh, students that we have here uh, in the studio, Emily uh, and we have Marina. And uh, so, uh, but we also have uh, four other uh, students. It's a six students team. Uh, and uh, that, uh, so we have four other students and uh, we have Vivian, uh, uh, joining us remotely and uh, who played the engagement uh, role, uh, manager role uh, for this capstone team. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, Doris uh, and uh, Walter and Roland uh, um, uh, joining us remotely, right? And uh, so the six of us together uh, will share their experience uh, with us. And uh, that I also um, on uh, remotely, joining us remotely uh, is my uh, partner, my uh, co-instructor, uh, and uh, Dr. Steve uh, Elston, uh, that uh, Steve uh, is uh, a very experienced, and he is another financial, um, uh, quantitative financial right. modeling expert, right? And uh, Steve has been in the industry, an academic, and a PhD from Princeton, uh, and uh, so we're so fortunate in have, uh, having Steve uh, work with us on the Capstone project as well, right? And uh, so, um, you all uh, come to Harvard, right? And, uh, and that was during the summer. 
that that's what we call the pre-cap stone, right? And uh, that you spend uh, three weeks here uh, at Harvard, uh, all of you, right? And uh, that uh, so at the time that I believe that the cohort we have about fifty students, uh, and uh, and I. Uh, I think that uh, was a wonderful experience, and uh, we have a lot of uh, good times and a lot of uh, uh, work got done. And uh, maybe that I will let y'all uh, that um, y'all uh, uh, online and as well um, uh, Marina and Emily here uh, to take us through the experience. Sure, uh, it was a wonderful three weeks. Um, we'll pass it over to our colleague Walter, uh, who's going to talk about the experience a little bit. Hello, uh, let me share just a few thoughts about this part because uh, this on-campus part of our uh, program is what makes it especially attractive. It makes it a real uh, university uh, experience for for many reasons, really. Just name a few. Uh, first of all, meeting the professors in person and attending lectures, labs, office hours, and discussing our uh, Project, projects, assignments, learning from, from the best in the field, uh, but also meeting other students to work together on group projects. And not only that, uh, also to enjoy study break activities, uh, many of them organized by university, like uh, on-campus attractions or uh, around Boston attractions as well. And uh, something I would add, from my personal experience, what I found uh, particularly interesting was the possibility to uh, to go to the Harvard English department uh, and uh, use the help of the writing center to consult my essay assignment, for example, uh, and other things like uh, attending a classical music concert in in the famous building of Sanders Theater. Uh, this is, I think, an ideal package to. Uh, uh, include in this kind of education that we have experienced. Wow. Okay. All right. So I'm I'm, I'm looking at the screen here, right? And uh, that so our students uh, prepare uh, some of the slides uh, that the, the pictures that they have shown on the screen. Um, that uh, so um, uh, can you talk to, uh, about um, you know what were you doing? And I think I recognize at least a couple <laughs> of them, right? And uh, that we have a special name for the dishes uh, that we enjoyed. So yeah, can you share? Absolutely. That was uh, Walter's the game. That's it. <laughs> Go for it, Marina. Can, can you spill the beans? <laughs> yeah. So that that was absolutely amazing experience. So that's a picture on a right top corner, like a amazingly super yummy uh, chip noodle. <laughs> We're actually planning to uh, visit that maybe today or tomorrow as well. So that was amazing experience to connect with uh, with peers and like your uh, like. Uh, 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 other students that that was incredible and the one on the right hand side on, on the corner right that was the last last day right uh, mm -hmm. of our uh, pre stone that was amazing I think that was all of us or mostly all of us that that absolutely amazing experience yeah. amazing. okay all right now um, the one that they shown before and uh, we have a tradition in our data science uh, capstone and pre-capstone and uh, whenever we have a new cohort come in uh, we always take them to this place and we call the cheap noodles right and uh, that uh, the noodles may be cheap uh, but uh, the value and the fellowship and uh, the learning and uh, is invaluable right and uh, so we had a great time so what what so AI for good um, the sustainable goal can you talk about that Yes, one of our colleagues online is going to speak a bit about this. Ronan. Yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> it's actually uh, a great opportunity to talk about this because we are a very international team. We come from all over the world. And our topic is uh, dealing with NASA and helping uh, in achieve UN sustainable goals through monitoring and prediction of algae and hydrological blooms were uh, a great experience because we are all from all over the world and we are joining together to achieve common goals and to and in that we are in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals and AI for Good. 
Yeah, so United Nations, and basically that has uh, defined uh, that I believe what, uh, 17 uh, sustainable goals, right? And uh, so this is one of the things that what we're trying to do as a cohort uh, and uh, as an institution and trying to make contributions uh, to uh, moving that uh, sustainable goal and to um, reality. And uh, so uh, the capstone projects that the students uh, work on is part of that. And then now, I've, um, um, at the pre-capstone uh, that uh, we have uh, students form teams and then uh, select the projects and the project that you all decided to work on uh, basically are what we uh, uh, call the NASA uh, um, algae project, right? And uh, so the team will explain about their project later. Uh, and uh, that I think that you have um, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, folks from NASA that you work with, right? And uh, we have Dr. Uh, Carlos Del Castillo, and he is the chief of the Ocean Ecology Laboratory. Uh, and uh, you also work with a couple other uh, NASA scientists uh, over the last few months, right? And, uh, and I think that um, uh, part of that experience, um, you actually get to go visit NASA, right? And uh, so uh, maybe you can take us uh, through that ex uh, NASA experience there. Absolutely, well, Doris is gonna uh, yeah, explain a bit about the experience and the amazing team that we've had supporting us throughout this project. Thanks, Emily. Um, so we just want to say we received a lot of support for the project. First of all, we have the Harvard academic team, Dr. Huang, Dr. Elston. They were always there to support us through all of our technical questions, just um, which is the best modeling techniques to use for a certain situation or like how to optimize performance on, on some of our models. So th those are really, really helpful. And um, also, like Dr. Huang men mentioned, we have a team of NASA scientists as our project sponsor. So um, Dr. Carlos Del Castillo is the chief of Ocean uh, Oncology Lab at NASA. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Seegers and Dr. Russell. They are also top scientists who are working with uh, Dr. Carlos as well. Um, so there are the subject mat matter experts who um, constantly help us answer some of the very tough questions such as um, why data the data that we see behaves in a certain way based on our analysis and then they always have very good feedback for us on everything that we do so it was really really um, great experience working with all, all of them and uh, like Dr. Hwan mentioned as well uh, they are very kind and generous and they offer us to go visit the pay satellite at the Goldart Center um, in, in DC. So some of our, our team members actually went and took pictures of the satellite in person. So I was just wanna say it's, it's a really uh, one, one in a lifetime experience to, to get a chance to visit a real satellite in person, right? Um, so we're gonna show some pictures later on as well. Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, it's really, it, it's a really great experience. Um, like, uh, uh, working in this project, and I, I do really, um, extremely grateful for the ex the experience as well. Okay, and uh, well, let's see it. Uh, the NASA pictures. Right. <laughs> yes, we had the wonderful opportunity to go visit uh, a couple of different times, actually. Um, in the summer, we went down and uh, we had lunch with Dr. Cecile Rousseau, uh, who's one of our advisors on the saltwater part of our project, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, and that was a really wonderful experience to learn more about uh, her career with NASA and her experience, uh, which was amazing. And then more recently uh, in October, uh, myself, Marina, and Vivian had the opportunity to go down to the Goddard Space Flight Center and uh, meet with Dr. C Carlos de Castillo himself. Uh, he was incredibly generous with his time. He spent a couple of hours ferrying us around the various buildings at the NASA uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, which was incredible. Um, and honestly, everything that we saw that day was a highlight. Um, but as Doris said, one of the, the main highlights was seeing that PACE satellite uh, in its own clean room getting worked on uh, just before it was about to be wrapped up uh, and sent to Florida for its launch, which is happening very, very soon. Um, and we also saw 
you know, amazing uh, other things in like a giant clean room where we saw the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope actually being built. That's sort of like a future generation of the Hubble telescope, which is absolutely incredible. So it's been an amazing experience, I guess is what we're all trying to say. Yeah, and look at those. I'll go back. Look at those bags. So Emily bought half of the gift store at that time. <laughs> <laughs> we did some damage in the gift shop, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this is? All right, this. Um, and go for it, Vivian, take it away. I am happy to jump in. Um, so we, Emily and I also visited a bunch of other museums when we were in DC in July over the summer. For instance, on the upper left corner, that picture was taken in the National Air and Space Museum, which was amazing, of course. And on top of that, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences took me out to see how the data is born. So as you can see, we went out on a boat, we got water samples, and then they took me back to their laboratory and we got I got to do lab work. So I am looking at cyanobacteria under a microscope, as well as I was doing some lab work uh, with water and chemicals and all that. It was a great experience because as a data scientist, often we only see the data itself, but this way I got to see how the data is born. So I was very thankful for that experience. All right, so uh, this project sponsored by NASA and it's a huge project, right? And uh, that you actually split into uh, two areas uh, uh, that you are looking into. And this is where we applied data science, machine learning, AI, and uh, to basically do uh, environmental uh, uh, science uh, studies. So um, you all wanted to share what you learned and uh, your uh, findings and discovery. All right, so we will kick it off then uh, with some of our remote teammates. Um, so Vivian, I'll pass it over to you. Did you know that over 50% of the Earth's oxygen is produced by one microscopic organism? This microscopic organism is phytoplankton. It lives in the upper layers of water bodies, such as oceans and lakes, and it photosynthesizes. This photosynthesis produces 50 to 70% of the Earth's oxygen, despite phytoplankton being only 1% of the Earth's biomass. So phytoplankton is clearly very important, but not only for oxygen production. As mentioned, the United Nations developed 17 sustainable development goals. Out of these 17, phytoplankton directly impacts four. These four are good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, life below water, and climate action. A good balance of phytoplankton is crucial for all this. For instance, a lake that has a good balance of phytoplankton is safe to visit both for animals and for dogs and humans. Also, a good balance for phytoplankton is very important for clean water that humans can consume. However, whenever this balance is off, that is a big problem. When the phytoplankton is too little, that can very quickly lead to starvation of animals in ocean bodies because the phytoplankton is the basis of the food webs in the ocean, ocean bodies, water bodies. However, when phytoplankton is too much, that is also very dangerous. For instance, a specific type of phytoplankton called cyanobacteria can lead to harmful algal blooms. These are toxic and this can be very dangerous both for humans and for dogs. It can lead to serious health issues as well as for death. So in demonstration of how important phytoplankton is, next slide. Um, as mentioned, NASA is putting into orbit a satellite early next year. This is called the PACE satellite. The P in PACE specifically stands for plankton, just showing how important phytoplankton is. It has its own satellite. Next slide. As mentioned, we wanted to use our data science skills for good. The United Nations has a yearly conference called AI for Good that is specifically designed to use data science and AI techniques to push the sustainable development goals as mentioned earlier. 
So we were always having AI for good in mind when we were developing our projects. We can divide our findings into two categories. One is AI for improved monitoring, where we have two projects, such as using satellite data to better predict phytoplankton, as well as creating a tool for lake managers to detect and monitor these harmful algal blooms. The other one is AI for improved understanding. Here we monitored one of the most remote water bodies on Earth, the Southern Ocean, as well as a very popular water body on Earth, Lake Mendota in Wisconsin. And with that, we are kickstarting with AI for improved monitoring. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, so since 1978, the ocean has been monitored from space through satellites. The way it works is that the satellite takes a picture of the surface of the Earth, divides that picture into smaller squares, and then translates the color in those small squares into color wavelengths. These color wavelengths are then translated into predicted phytoplankton levels. Phytoplankton is typically green, so the color of the water can be used to predict cytoplankton levels. And starting early next year, the PACE satellite will be launched into orbit. This satellite will have a very sensitive device that will capture a wider array of polar wavelengths than what is currently available through satellite data. At the moment, you can only get data of this quality using handheld devices, which means you have to travel to the body of the water and take manual samples, which is difficult and costly. Uh, we built an AI tool that uses this data that is similar to what the PACE satellite will use to translate these color wavelengths into phytoplankton levels. And our model results are very promising. They indicate that there will be a massive improvement in phytoplankton monitoring quality once the PACE satellite is launched. But our work has also focused on better understanding the variation of phytoplankton in remote places such as the Southern Ocean, as Emily and Marina will explain. Thank you, Ronan. Yes, so this next analysis focused on the Southern Ocean, which is the ocean around Antarctica. The Southern Ocean plays a crucial role in regulating the global climate because it absorbs 50% uh, of oceanic carbon dioxide and anthropogenic heat, which is heat generated by humans. Um, it was also a vast environment, uh, which is very complex. And as such, phytoplankton distributions in this area are not uniform. So it was necessary for us to break up our analysis into smaller regions around Antarctica, which you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. Our research showed that phytoplankton concentrations are higher than average most often in the northernmost region of the Southern Ocean, close to the Indian Ocean, which is this graphic on the right-hand side of the slide. So we focused our analysis on this particular region. Now on the next slide, as you can see on the left-hand side, we have phytoplankton concentrations during both the Antarctic summer and the Antarctic winter. Now, as Ronan mentioned previously, the lighter color indicates areas where phytoplankton concentration is high. And we consider areas where this concentration is significantly above average to be phytoplankton hotspots. Now, phytoplankton concentrations are typically highest in the midsummer, which is actually December to February in Antarctica. Levels then tend to decrease into the winter. Identifying these hotspots allows us to better understand the region's marine ecosystem as well as its capacity to absorb carbon dioxide. So after we identified these hotspots, we then wanted to further understand what was actually driving them. So I'll pass it over to Marina to explain those particular findings. Thank you, Emily. So for this particular region, we found that the most influential factors are sea surface temperature and mixed layer depth. Mixed layer is the top layer of the ocean where everything is stirred together by the wind and waves and water uh, properties are uniform and have little variations. When the season in this region transitions into winter, the water gets colder and winds are stronger. So this mixed layer gets stirred with the deeper layers of the ocean. This allows nutrients to be brought up to the surface. Then starting in the spring, sp spring and continuing until midsummer, the phytoplankton population increases. Right, because we have more daylights, nutrients are still plentiful, and the temperatures are higher. In addition to that, uh, uh, with the rise in global temperature with the due to the climate change, there is a possibility of stabilizing the sur sea surface layers and limiting nutrient subwelling. That might affect uh, phytoplankton concentration and their uh, capacity to absorb the carbon dioxide, and as a result, Southern Ocean um, effectiveness as a carbon and heat sink. 
So while we were focusing on the, one of the most remote and least accessible places on Earth, I'm now passing it over to Walter, who will be talking about well-known lake in the United States. While phytoplankton does a great job in the Southern Ocean, as Emily and Marina explained, it can also be harmful, especially in freshwater bodies. This happens when cyanobacteria release toxins contaminating water or when good balance is not maintained and so-called algal blooms happen, as Vivian mentioned before. To deepen our understanding of some aspects of the mechanics of harmful algal blooms, we applied various data science techniques to analyze in situ data, describing algae and key water physical physical chemical parameters. So algal blooms are harmful when they lead to formation of so-called dead zones in lakes where aquatic life cannot survive because of low or even zero dissolved oxygen level. The data we analyzed describes formation of such dead zone as shown on the bottom plot where dark green color represents depletion of oxygen in the deeper layers of the lake happening during the summer. How does it happen? There are two ways algal blooms cause creating dead zones. First, the overgrowth of algae on the surface blocks sunlight from underwater plants that could otherwise produce oxygen. This effect was confirmed by analyzing data describing sunlight reaching deeper levels in the lake measured by sensors immersed in the water. Then dead algae sink to the lake bottom and get decomposed by bacteria, consuming whatever oxygen is left in the water, leading to zero level or as seen on the uh, plot denoted by dark color. Additionally, if the type of algae were cyan cyanobacteria, they release toxins when uh, their cells are destroyed. The negative effects of algal blooms are more intensive if the water temperature is higher for two reasons. Higher temperature allows algae to grow thicker and faster, but also water, also higher water temperature stops mixing different layers of water, as Marina explained, for the southern ocean, which in case of the lake results in stopping distribution of oxygen to deeper layers where it is needed by fish and other organisms that live just there because they need cool, deep water. For this reason, the risk of harmful algal blooms impacting lakes ecosystems increases because of water temperature increasing in lakes in general, which our analysis also confirmed for Lake Mendota in particular. As a result, it is increasingly important to monitor and predict algal blooms as accurately as possible, and Doris has done a great job implementing this using NASA satellite data. Doris? Thank you, Walter. Um, so the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States collaborates with NASA and NOAA on a project called SCIEN. SCIEN stands for Cyanobacterial Assessment Network. It is a web-based tool that shows the cyanobacterial, cy cyanobacteria cell counts estimated using cell light remote sensing data. This tool allows users to see if harmful algal bloom is impacting a specific area in the US on a near real-time basis. To enhance this tool, we developed a Python-based application that not only showcased the latest cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria cell count of the area, but also the historical trend and a dynamic visual that shows how the cell count changes over time. As shown on the top right corner here is a plot of the cyanobacteria cell count for Lake Erie. You can see the changing colors indicating increased cell count in certain regions of the lake. On the bottom right, we have a seasonality analysis showing when the cyanobacteria count peaks during the year. Then finally, on the bottom left here, we show a forecast of the future of cyanobacteria counts using a classic time series forecasting method called SEREMA which stands for Seasonal Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average Model. This tool is built open source and is going to be available for general public use. So not only scientists and local authorities can gain better insights about the lakes, residents who live around the area can also be 
informed of any potential da danger that might cause them health issues. So this brings us to the end of our presentation today. Um, as a final note, uh, we would like to thank our professors, Dr. Huang and Dr. Allison again, for giving us such an uh, amazing opportunity to work on this uh, such a cool project. Um, also a big shout out to our project sponsors, the NASA team scientists, uh, Dr. Del Castillo, Dr. Seegers, Dr. Russell. Um, thank you very much for getting us through this project and being so patient with us. It was absolutely wonderful working with um, the NASA team. Finally, um, thank you everyone for your attention. Now we can turn it back to Dr. Huang for the Q&A section. Well, thank you very much. And uh, this is awesome. And uh, you all did a wonderful job in uh, looking at the dashboard. And uh, uh, that's amazing, right? But thank you for making contributions to the environmental science field, right? And uh, so, so let, let, let's bring this to uh, the um, more applications, uh, um, uh, usefulness uh, of what you have discovered, right? Um, that so, so, so how would, how would someone that may be using water uh, for, uh, using water for uh, recreations or a manager of water supplies, um, be able to leverage your result, your, dash, uh, your dashboard? That's a great question, uh, Dr. Frank. I'll turn it over to Doris uh, to maybe answer Yeah, that I can take this one. Thank you, Edwin. Um, so I guess uh, with more clarity on exactly which part of the lake is impacted by um, how harmful algal bloom, like um, the plot that we show there, um, or which, part are, which parts are not impacted at all, um, the residents um, or the lake managers can choose to uh, close down only parts of the lake and still keep the rest open so that that could sort of minimize or, or reduce the impact or disruption that the uh, HAB has to, to general public. That's one use case I can think of. Um, on the other hand, also the residents itself, uh, themselves, if they know exactly, uh, let's say if they know exactly when HAB will happen to uh, to a lake near in their region. They can plan their activities ahead and avoid going near the the impacted area um, at certain times. Um, so I, I think those are um, uh, the two main use cases I can think of. Okay. All right. So wonderful. Uh, now uh, we are opening up uh, the forum and uh, to interact and uh, with our. Uh, audience here and uh, that I see that um, um, uh, we have uh, questions uh, um, from our audience and uh, maybe that uh, we can get some of them to join us and have a conversation here. Uh, Greg. Uh, yeah, so I was very interested by this research. So I, I live in uh, Menominee, Wisconsin, and we have a lake at the center of town that suffers from exactly this problem, uh, an algae bloom every summer. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it's very severe, so uh, nobody can swim in the lake, uh, nobody can fish from the lake. Um, and it's, it's really a big problem, and otherwise this could be a wonderful place for tourism. But, um, uh, so I was uh, uh, very, very interested to see that uh, you guys um, uh, are, are working on this very important problem. Well, thank you, thank yeah. you. Thank you for the comment. You are mentioning Wisconsin, so actually, I don't know if you heard, Walter here analyzed Lake Mendota, which is in Wisconsin, and uh, it's very important we agree with that. I think one key thing to understand is um, is understanding the different, different drivers that lead to these algal blooms, understand these lakes better, and maybe mitigate them before they happen. I don't know, Walter, if you would like to add something. Uh, yeah, well, so so about all the drivers, there are, there's a big, a huge common part uh, between uh, fresh water and salt water. And Marina explained this for Antarctic Ocean. Uh, it applies to lakes in, in terms of uh, temperature, sunlight and nutrients. Uh, there are some differences, though, because uh, uh, especially nutrients are get uh, more abandoned in uh, fresh water bodies, especially due to uh, human activities like agriculture and uh, uh, improper waste management. So uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrate from uh, resulting from human activities are the main factors that uh, 
uh, drive uh, algal blooms in lakes. Wonderful. And uh, so um, I see that uh, we have a Srinivas. Uh, Srinivas, uh, Dad, you have a question? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. It's really exciting and motivating. So I have a couple of questions. So one question is, uh, can this model be applied to uh, lakes within the United States uh, or probably where we have a lot of uh, human population? And uh, also, I see <clears throat> uh, you guys have done this on the ocean, but can we apply this model also to some kind of a swamp? So for example, if you go to Louisiana, uh, where we have a lot of swamps, and then that's why we're going to big source of these kind of algae, which can damage the ocean life. So these are my two questions, and thank you so much. So, um, Ronan, do you want to answer how PACE is going to impact the global applicability of the water bodies analyzed? Oh, well, yes. So part of our limitation in the, the lakes that we addressed was the satellite resolution. So the, the current satellite uh, resolution that we have only covers uh, a small because when, we, uh, when the surface is cut up into squares, it is a very wide range of area that we can collect data from. So sometimes the lake is smaller than the, the, than the square itself that we are capturing, and this uh, makes the measuring process very difficult. And we are also getting very little wavelength data from it. So with the upcoming base satellite, we expect a higher, uh, that higher resolutions will allow us to cover a higher, uh, more, more lakes than we, what we currently have. So that would definitely expand our area of application. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Srinivas. And uh, so uh, we have a question from uh, Christina. Yeah, so I was actually wondering, um, and I, I might have missed this uh, since my connection dropped at some point, what, what was the scope of the project? I saw that there was a now was done in the ocean around Antarctica, and then it looked like later there's um, a select few key lakes in the U.S. At, so I was just curious what what was um, the scope of the, the final real-time analysis project? That's a great question. Um, yes, we did cover a lot of different things. Uh, we had sort of several different, different sub-scopes uh, within this project. Uh, the I guess the Southern Ocean being absolutely enormous, and then some of our colleagues looking at smaller freshwater lakes. Um, I might turn it over to uh, someone on the freshwater team to maybe answer that. Uh, Doris, maybe, if you're able. Uh, yes, on the freshwater side, uh, we, like um, the dashboard, actually, uh, the, the one that uh, we presented last, the dashboard covers all the lakes within uh, the United States. That's what we have data for. And then, um, when we uh, look at uh, the drivers, when um, Walter was presenting, um, he was looking at a specific lake in Wisconsin, uh, Lake Mendota, um, because um, to get uh, institute data for a specific lake, it's a very time consuming. So we have a lot of satellite data, um, but not a lot of institute data, like actual lake uh, water sample data. It's not mm -hmm. um, uh, available to us. So when we're doing driver analysis, our scope is much, um, like the data set scope is much uh, smaller. Um, but the dashboard, it's, it's because we're using satellite data um, and that covers the, the whole uh, United States. Hope that answer your question. I see, yeah, so so some things are the scope smaller um, for yeah. the, the kind of samples that you have had, but otherwise this is a widely. Really? Yeah, yeah, it really depends on the data set that uh, we, we have available to us. I see, thank you. No problem. I can maybe just add to that. So we wanted to also uh, close the gap and better understand what the drivers for, uh, for, for those like hotspots and uh, uh, high concentration. So it would be uh, in a salt water that would be affecting the food web and also carbon cons uh, um, absorption. And in the fresh water, that would be direct um, impact on the algae bloom and health of animals and people. Thank you. Um, Kevin. I was just curious as to um, what drove, what, if there are any scientific factors that drove the choice of Lake Mendota as being representative, re representative uh, of what might be 
going on here? I mean, I think it's a good sized lake. It's not a huge lake. So why was that one chosen as opposed to one of the great lakes or something, any, some lake anywhere in the country, really? I can take it. <laughs> so uh, part of the answer you've just said is it's not the, the greatest, but not the smallest either. It's, it's, it's a good representative of, of lakes and kind of the right size for uh, the processes that we wanted to observe. The other thing is uh, data. Uh, there, we used three different sources of data because different institutions are uh, happen to be very interested in uh, Lake Mendota, University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison, and uh, some in, uh, environmental institutions as well. Uh, so there are some sensors they that uh, have been immersed in the water there for uh, around 20 years now. Uh, and basically this is uh, uh, what makes analysis doable the source of data. Plus, uh, this is an example of a, of a lake uh, in, in, in the climate uh, that where uh, many interesting things happen. For example, uh, the particular climate of Wisconsin uh, enables uh, something called lake turnover every spring, something that we could analyze and something that I, I personally found very interesting the discovery that feeds the lake annually. Uh, things like this don't happen in other climates. Does it answer your question? Yes, I think so. Very good. It's like because of the temperature variation, the four seasons. Was yes, exactly. And and uh, and uh, uh, in Lake Mendota, we have uh, thermal stratification and in the summer and inverse thermal stratification during the winter. And between the two, we have the turnover of isothermal lake. Uh, I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. And uh, so, um, given the time, and uh, maybe that we uh, take this last general question. There's a last, there's a general question out there uh, from our audience, and uh, asking uh, what data analysis techniques uh, and uh, were used, and uh, did you use uh, any type of ML models? I can start off. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, we, uh, one of the major problems with the Southern Ocean analysis in particular was the size of the data. Um, I, worked, I looked at two different resolutions, um, which came up to more than 3 trillion data points. So just having to use advanced tools to actually deal with that amount of data was really, really important. Um, maybe Marina, do you want to speak about the tools you use for the driver Absolutely. analysis? Absolutely. And from the uh, modeling perspective, we use uh, different approaches to uh, exclude any bias um, in, the, in our modeling approaches. So we use CERIMA and we also added exogenous factors to that. We also tried another state space uh, model as um, unobserved component models. And we additionally, we use random uh, forest. Um, we, on the random forest, we use uh, feature uh, importance, uh, d a couple of different feature important techniques to identify the factors and see their um, influence on the, on the results. And now maybe I'm passing over to the freshwater team. <laughs> okay. We used, <laughs> we used both uh, categorical and uh, regression analysis. There is a long list, including uh, easy to understand models, such as linear regression, as well as more black box-like models, such as random forests and KNN. The list is very long. As well as Doris used time series analysis, as well as water, sorry. We did a lot of analytics. We had to sort of uh, yeah, so also favor interpretability over black box models in some cases. Um, and sorry, Doris, I cut you off. Please continue. No, no, no. Oh, I'm still going. That was it. So <laughs> go for oh, it. Okay, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, I, um, I was just uh, want to add um, for the uh, cyanobacteria analysis for the lakes, um, our the main focus for that. Um, um, other than the temporal and spatial analysis is the uh, prediction, right? So we want to be able to make good prediction for future harmful algal bloom that happens. So um, for that, I actually uh, we actually tried a couple of different uh, techniques. Um, the one that we finally get to use is uh, Sorima, but we also did try uh, using a Facebook algorithm um, the the profit and and um, a couple others as well to to get to like so 
um, to 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 get uh, the best uh, results um, from uh, for for the predictions actually. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And uh, so, uh, one you did a wonderful job. And uh, thank you, Tim. And uh, Steve and I cannot uh, be power uh, powder uh, than. Um, you know, seeing uh, the accomplishment and uh, what you are able to achieve. Um, so uh, this is actually uh, brings to the end of our program tonight. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, for uh, your attendance. Uh, and uh, so again, this is our data science capstone team, one of the ten, one of one of the ten teams uh, that we have uh, in this cohort. And uh, so uh, now uh, we got what couple more weeks to go. You uh, finishing and graduating, earning your Harvard Master Degree in two weeks. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Well, congratulations and uh, thanks everyone. Have a good evening.